that Jesus was absolutely righteous in his thoughts. Jesus couldn't even sin in his brain. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been the son of God. So as a little boy growing up, he never had a wrong thought, not one. He never had a bad thought, not one. He never had a false belief, not one. In fact, he was the embodiment, the essence, the quintessential essence of what truth was. He didn't just exhibit truthful beliefs. He was truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So imagine the Edenic mind. God created you and I to only think righteously, to think right thoughts, to think good thoughts, to think true thoughts. It's crazy when you start to think about that. What would it be like for Jesus? And his whole life, he was innocent. He never sinned, in, even in his head. If he had sinned in his head, and I've said this and I'm saying it again because I'm, I'm going to bring it home. If he had sinned in his head, in his thinking, he wouldn't be Jesus. He wouldn't be God. But he didn't. You say, well, how come he got angry and tipped over the... Well, there's a big difference between righteous anger and fleshly anger, isn't there? Jesus was operating, when he was tipping over the tables, he was operating out of the third level of his conscience, was justice. See, this is how he thought, and this is how he acted on how he thought in his mind. See, if his throne or if his authority is established on righteousness and justice, then justice is whenever you come up against something, instinctively, your mind wants to make bad things good. That's justice. Your mind wants to make wrong things right. That's justice. Your mind wants to take something false and replace it with the truth. That's justice. So Jesus, when he walked into the temple and saw that his father, who he was submitted to, his father's house was being treated with disrespect. There was a righteous anger, emotion, came from the premise of a righteous thought. My father's house shall be a house of prayer, not of commerce. And so he, in his zeal, got rid of all the tables and Jesus was an absolutely innocent. So Jesus socially would have been considered by those of the day as not innocent. But his heart was so at peace. In fact, he's called the Prince of Peace. His heart was so at peace that he could be reclining at a table in a prominent religious Jewish house with all these dignitaries and Jewish guys around him, and a woman who had made decisions in her life of a sexual nature, she was considered a prostitute, a woman of the night, took the courage, <laughs> when I think about what, she, what it took for her, to open the door of that house and to walk into the lion's den where all these men are judging her, all these men have condemned her, criticized her for her choices in life, and she knelt at the feet of Jesus, and she began the alabaster jar and, and washed his feet. And, and Jesus, his heart was so at peace. That was good. Wow. And yet all these other religious people, judgment, Condemnation, And they actually turned their condemnation against Jesus. How can you accept someone like that? In fact, he was criticized because he had such a peaceful heart about the world. He had publicans, you know, guys who own bars as best friends, as friends. And tax collectors. Ooh. Tax co I mean, and he drank, for goodness sake. And they say, he's a drunkard. He's this, he's that. And Jesus didn't care. He was at peace. Because his brain never thought a bad thought, never thought. He was designed, 
He had the Edenic mind. One day, our minds are going to be restored to that. Isn't that a good news? In a blinking of an eye, right now, the, the software has a virus. The software is running, is full of viruses. Our brains are full of viruses. We're going to talk about what the viruses are. But a defrag situation uh, program has come in called the Word of God. And it's slowly tracing out all the bad code. It's tracing out all the viruses and it's effacing them and it's replacing it with the God code so that your brain starts to operate the way it was designed to. Right now, it's not. But as Christians, we now have the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, to take us from the fallen mind to the Edenic mind. Isn't that powerful? So your mind was designed to think in submission to Almighty God, complete submission. Your mind was also designed to think righteously, good, right, and true thoughts. And when you don't think good, right, and true thoughts, you then do what the Arbinger Institute, you start to justify your bad behavior. And you, come, you have to treat people as objects rather than as people. And your heart is at war. Jesus was the opposite. Why? Because he thought righteously. And we are to have the mind of... Christ. Wow. Okay, so the third thing was justice. So if he thought righteously, he acted out on those thoughts and it was to bring justice to the world. Wherever he went, wherever he did anything, and you are too, you're at the checkout and you're looking at a situation that is wrong, instinctively your mind will want to make it right, even if it costs you. You're in a confrontational situation. Instinctively, the divine mind or the Edenic mind will want to take something that is bad and make it good. You want to correct what is false. That's why some people go into therapy because they want to, they, they instinctively somehow they want to ch help people change and to grow and to become better. Now, covering all of that, Jesus, his brain didn't just think loving thoughts. God is actual love. <laughs> so I can imagine the uh, meat-covered flesh suit <laughs> having to try and catch up to the, spirit, the divine spirit within Christ. As just a little boy, he knew his father's will and he knew the thoughts and intents of people's hearts. He could just feel it and know it. And he was right every time. He was absolutely true every time. He operated in love. So if he is the essence of what love is, then he was patient. Isn't that 1 Corinthians? He was kind. He, was, he, he never rejoiced in wickedness delighted in the truth. These are all the things of love, aren't they? He hoped. He never lost hope. He always believed. These are the things of love. His mind thought like that. Adam's mind thought like that. Your mind has the potential to think like that. And now that the Spirit of God has come inside, your eyes can be opened. You now can see visions. You now can hear the voice of God. You now can comprehend spiritual things, whereas before you can't. And now you're on a journey to fix your brain, fix your psychosis, because this is what it's, it is right now. This is what's happening. This is the fallen mind. At the core of who we are when we're little kids, we decide that we are going to be the Lord, the captain, the ruler of our own life. We are going to decide what is right in our own eyes. We're going to decide what is good and what is bad. We are going to decide what is truth and what is false. And as we grow up as children, because we become 
the Lord of our own existence and we reject the place and function of authority of our parents because our parents are constantly trying to tell us or guide us this is wrong, this is right. They're trying to give us a framework for moral absolution, for morality. Okay, this is right, this is wrong. Think like this, we behave like this. This is the, we don't behave like that. And us as children, we respond to that authority in different ways. If we dishonor that authority, life does not go well with us. If we respond to that authority, as I've already said, we start to live according to the way God designed our brains. Here's one thing. When I was a little boy, I made a judgment. I made a vow. I made a thought that was not the truth. I saw my mother go through menopause and she would have hot flushes as a teenager, actually. It was a young teenager. And my mother would come into the house. She'd lift up the, and she, the windows and run around the house lifting up all the windows, freaking out. Why is it so hot in here? Let's get some air through the house. Because we had uh, air conditioning that was conductive with, with moving of air. So we're lifting up all the windows to get all this air moving through. We didn't have refrigerated air conditioning. Anyway, so after 10 minutes, she goes, why is it so freezing in here? Close everything, close everything. Her hot flushes were gone, so she's now closing everything. Now, I, in my mind, didn't process that correctly. I processed it as women. (laughs) They can't be trusted. They're schizophrenic. They're weird. That's it. Now, that is false. I dishonored my mother. I believed, even though it sounds funny, I believed a false premise. It was written like my, my wet cement of a brain suddenly over time hardened. And now it was assigned to me like a jailer that I would look at a woman and subconsciously, not consciously, because of course, consciously, I don't think women are weird. Um, (laughs) But subconsciously, I, I don't, you know, not trust. But I grew up and then, check this, I put onto my, my wife the very distrust that I judged my mother for. <gasps> Same with you and I. When we start breaking down the way God designed us, for example, your husband really isn't distant, non-emotional, secretive, and untrustworthy. You made that decision by your father. Your relationship with your dad made that assumption and you believe that in your heart and now that's a sign to you through all your relationships with boyfriends and then your, eventually your husband. And you know what you fear the most? It eventuates, doesn't it? What you fear the most actually trans... It comes to pass. So that guy that you married wasn't those things, but you have projected that so much onto him that he eventually became all those things that you feared the most. Wow. And our brains are broken. And so we have beliefs, what Dave Riddell in Living Wisdom calls king lies. And you need truth coaches, a truth coach to counteract the king lie. Here's another lie that a lady would face. You believed when you were just in your teenage years the lie that I am my body. My appearance, the way I look, is my value. That's a subconscious king lie. But what does God say? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're beautiful. Wow. Wow. So what happens with a woman who believes that king lie is she grows up 
caring about what she looks like, even to the point of mutilating her body to become completely different and all kinds of different things in order to appease in her heart her lack of value in herself. And it usually leads to sexual promiscuity because you're trying to get the approval of men like you tried to get the approval of your father. Wow. The things we believe in a fallen mind when we don't come under the supreme authority of Jesus Christ, his rulership, when we don't accept what he thinks as truth, we start to think that when that guy sexually did something to you at a younger age, as you grew up, you naturally thought, because it was your first sexual experience, that you were gay. You're not gay. You had just established a belief system at a very early age, the cement hardened, and now you are struggling with these thoughts because they are assigned to you. Let's look at the scriptures. The Bible says that your heart, uh, it goes on a, a psychological uh, story. Most people don't read it as a psychological story because it's veiled. But the story where the young man owed the, the ruler a lot of money and as he owed him a lot of money, the ruler forgave him for everything. He said, good. So the guy goes away and finds a guy who own, owes him a few bucks or a, a little. And he goes off on this guy. You owe me, you owe me, you owe me. It's the same guy that just was forgiven all this other stuff. And he just tears into this young guy. Now the ruler hears about this situation and imprisons him. And it's, the Bible actually, the words that are related after that are very interesting because it's actually talking about your psychology. It says it is a, you are assigned a tormentor that's going to torment you in prison until you pay back your debt in full. This will, this will take place on men's hearts as the secrets of men's hearts have been revealed. This, unless you forgive from your heart. Wow. So I had to go back to my mother. I had to go back to my father as I was tracing, facing and replacing all the wrong thinking to start try and think right. And it's a lifelong struggle. Oh God, bring the day when in an instant, in a, in a twinkling of an eye, my whole body and my mind will be changed back to the Edenic way of thinking. And I will, my struggles will be over. I will have righteousness as the big basic right to how I think. But I had to go to my mother and I asked to ask her forgiveness. And there are people in authority over through life. See, what happens is, unless you forgive from your heart of these things, you're assigned a psychological torment that it was going to plague you for the rest of your life. All your relationships are going to have those certain prisons. See, some people do not understand that they've rebelled against the place and function of authority in their life so much they were never taught it until they end up in a psychological prison and have to self-medicate themselves and have to do all kinds of things to justify their bad behavior or the feeling of why their behavior and what they believe is incongruent. So you've got a situation where a young man Will, will, will be rebelling against authority so much that you end up in, in real prison. So our fallen mind, we create our own worldview from a state of unrighteousness and injustice. And this is an Evansism. But I believe that from that foundation, all of our problems boil down to two reasons, actually three. We're too lazy because avoidance and procrastination and all those sorts of things are a form of laziness. Or we're too fearful to deal with things in order to change. 
So let me explain how that works. You can, all your problems in life, most of your issues in life, conflicts, the hearts at war, can be boiled down to you're fearful in the situation or you're too darn lazy to fix it or to do something about it. You can boil it down to those two things. And at the core of it is you were proud, you were prideful. That's at the core. That's right at the bottom. So let's have a look at this. You've come to Pastor Gary or you come to me and I've done you know, a fair bit of counselling in my time. And as I sat down there, I talked to the person and I said, okay, we've discovered, we, we realise that most of your issues and the way you see your husband is the way... Uh, you saw your father, your relationship with your father, and it's broken. So you need to go and see your father to deal with this. You need to go see the authority figure or the person that you made the judgment, the vow against, and ask for forgiveness. And that, that truth will set you free from that mindset. I was just prompted then by the Holy Spirit to tell this story. So I'm going to squirrel you for a second. I used to walk into a room... And I didn't realize this. I used to walk into rooms because of certain incidences in my life. And everybody in that room was kind of against me. It was because of rejection psychosis. I would walk into a room and instantly I would think everybody in that room really didn't like me. They didn't know me. And... If, and it was up to them to come and talk to me. I didn't realise I was thinking like that until the Holy Spirit showed me the incident where I had made that vow and I broke, I, I came to a conclusion that was false. And then when I was healed of that, I walked. now I walked into a room, I remember the day, it was at Hillsong, it was in the hub and I walked into a room, the, Brian was there, there was a whole bunch of the music team and everybody, and as I walked in, I just instantly began to weep because I realised they all actually like me. They all actually love me. The rejection psychosis was broken. Some of you in this room are at war with the world because of something that happened in the past. Just look at the transformed life of Joyce Meyer having to deal with a father who raped her her whole life. Imagine what she thought. But God can transform your mind, transform your family, transform you. And I'm on a journey. I cry out to God, God, change me. This is, it's, it's a tough thing. But that's the cross that we are called to bear, isn't it? to die to ourself and to live for Christ, to get the mind of Christ. So we'll, it all comes down to fear and laziness. So we've had a counselling session. You realise that your father, you've got to go see him. And so one of two things will happen. You'll come back to me in a month and we'll be in church and I'll come up to you and say, hey, did you go and see your dad? You'll say to me, hey, I did go see my dad, but I drove there and I parked my car in front of the house and and, you know, I just, I, I couldn't go in. I couldn't see him because I was too scared. I was too afraid. And that's why that conflict, that trauma continues in your life. Or you would say to me, you know, Pastor, I've been so busy lately. I haven't got around to it. I'll get there eventually. I'll go and talk to him soon. And when I go and talk to him soon, it'll, it'll all be cool. And I'll go, lazy. <laughs> You're either fearful or lazy. Because that comes out of a heart that has not surrendered to Christ. It comes out of psychosis that doesn't think righteousness or justice. Okay. How to restore the divine mind. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance, in congruent accordance with the Spirit, have their minds set. Have you got a mindset on what the Spirit desires? The Spirit is within you. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed. Now that word governed points to my thesis, doesn't it? Of the place and function of authority in your life. 
You are either governed by the fallen mind or you're governed by Christ. You're either submitted to God or you're not. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is what? Life and peace. That's what we want. That's the objective. To be a man of peace, a woman of peace. To walk around and when they're confronting with people who are in their hearts are at war and they confront you, you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really encouraged because my sister-in-law and my wife are really doing this in the home. I see it. I see it all the time. They are trying to have hearts of peace when people come to them with hearts at war, justifying their bad behavior and all kinds of things. And they've arrested that. And, they say, and, I've, wa- and I've watched it. I've, I've noticed little things, even with me. My, heart, my wife comes to me with a heart of peace and I'm at a heart of war with her. <laughs> she comes to me with a heart of peace. I'm going, oh, that's good. I like that. That's cool. So how to get the Edenic divine mind, how to restore the divine mind. First, submit to the divine authority. Have you done that? Can you do that? Will you do that? Some of us, when we gave our life to Christ, we didn't give it fully. We didn't submit fully. You've heard the song, I surrender all. I surrender all. Do we really surrender all? Uh, Do we have the mind of Christ where we fully die to ourselves and live completely according to his principles, worldview, idea, what's right, what's, what's true and what's good? I think it's a challenge, isn't it? So my question to you today is, in order to get to the divine mind or the Edenic mindset, the way you were designed, submit to his lordship, submit to his authority, say, Jesus... All my ideas, all my views, all my truth, my truth. You heard that in, the, in social media. Oh, his truth is this and her truth is that and you've got to accept their truth. No, you don't. You accept one truth and that is the way, the truth and the life, Jesus Christ. That is absolute. Because what they're trying to tell you is there is no absolute truth. It's a lie, and it will cause your life to end in destruction. Secondly, start to trace, face, and replace all the bad, the wrong, and the false beliefs with good, right, and truth. That's the renewing of your mind. So in your mind, you get the area where you're struggling in and you get the scripture which counters that or the scriptures which counter it and you memorize it. Remember the message I preached on taking the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and you start fighting with it and you have to literally memorize those scriptures in order to fight. It's called cognitive therapy. It's not new. The Bible taught it way back. Thirdly, courageously work hard to make bad things good, wrong things right, and reject false things for the truth. And finally, love. Start, try your best. Just at least try. Start operating in love. David, be a bit more patient. Please. David, please. Be kinder. I've got to rewire my brain. David, can you rejoice in the truth? Can you always hope? You lose hope like that. Can you hope, keep the hope alive? Because without hope, there is no faith. The substance of things hoped for is faith. So we come to a close. Adam had a mind that was created to think like God wants us to think. 
Jesus walked this earth and thought thoughts. He had an Edenic mind, a righteous mind, a justice mind. We have fallen, but we have this hope and this, the potential to reverse the fallen nature of this world. Have you submitted to Christ? If you want to change, do you really want to change? I said this in the first service and I didn't think I was going to say it in the second because you know what I do is I, I study a whole lot and I read a lot and I, and I kind of work out in my mind a structure of how I want to present my study or my talk. And then I say, Holy Spirit, bring back to my memory at the right moments the things that you want me to share with people because those things are usually the life-changing moments when the penny drops. Hmm. And so when I've been studying all of this, my mind has, was drawn to the worst midnight moments of my life. You see, I'd grown up in a good Christian home when my parents taught me the place and function of authority. And yet, I developed bad thinking. I don't know where I developed it from, maybe because that's the way I receive love. But you understand that God's love language, do you know what God's love language is? That's the way he thinks. You think, oh, what, what's love language? Well, some people receive love be, by doing things for them. That's called acts of service. Some people receive love by words, affirmations, I feel really loved when you affirm me. Some people feel loved by physical touch. Some people, feel, you know, you understand that, right? Some people, it's quality time. So we have a different, we all have different love languages and we usually love our spouse or the other, our partners in the way that we want to be loved. And so I was loving on God through acts of service. It was how big my crusades and my concerts could be because at the end of, I called them consades because they were concerts with preaching and altar calls. <laughs> Doesn't matter where I went. It was how big they could get. Not just a thousand, not two thousand, twelve thousand at a time. And I'd preach and we would have ten deep and three hundred people at every single one of those give their life to Christ. There were months, I remember three months I went not one day without leading someone to Christ. The zealousness inside of me for him was so great that I wanted to do so much, so big. It was how big, how much, how many people got saved constantly and all over, you know, wherever I went because I wanted to show him how much I love him. And then trauma happened. The darkest moments where I lost it all. In one single day, I realized that my marriage and my family was over. And I lost my home that I'd worked 25 years for, completely lost it. I lost my church. I was a senior pastor of my own church and I had to walk away. I lost all my finances. Three months earlier, I lost two children and had to bury them. So all in a small space of time, loss, 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 trauma, trauma, until I found myself in a single bedroom apartment in another state, all alone, asking God, why didn't you protect my home? I'm out there doing ministry for you, and yet you didn't protect my home. And I've lost everything. And I even lost my health. And in all of that, God spoke to me. He said, son, you believe the wrong thing. What? My love language is not acts of service. He didn't say these words, but I felt it. It felt like he said, I really don't care what you do for me. I could raise up someone else in a heartbeat to do all those other things. 
He said to me, son, I just wanted quality time. I just wanted you and I to love on each other. I had to go to a prophet to learn that. Because my mind couldn't hear anymore in the spirit. You can get show shut down by grief and pain and loss. And I was sitting in this office of one of the most renowned prophets in the whole southern hemisphere and all over the world. And Dave McCracken looked at me in the eye and he said, the Spirit of God has told me that you have ministerial idolatry. You put ministry and achievement and all that sort of thing way before your relationship with God. And I was dumbfounded. That's purely because I developed a lie. It wasn't true. Wow. Set me free. Now I'm on the other end of it. I've, I've, the pendulum swung way over the other side. <laughs> and now I've got to pick my socks up again and start to really function like I, I'm running on one cylinder. I'm a V8 running on one cylinder and I'm always, and I'm just being vulnerable with you. It's a struggle in life just to start again when you get smashed by one of your bad, false and wrong thoughts and ideas and belief systems. You have to pick yourself up again. And that's the fight of faith. True warriors. Some of you are bloody on a mess, on a muddy field, having been beaten up by life. And you're lying there right now and you just don't want to get up. And I'm calling you as a warrior of the cross. Get up off that ground and start to fight again because you will indeed have a divine mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you bow your heads across this place?